Hi everybody, it's Melissa from Starry Family Farm. And today, I'm going to be reading for March 20th for the Bible in a Year Challenge. And all my previous readings are in a playlist called Bible in a Year Readings, I believe. And I will link that playlist to the end of this video. Happy first day of spring. It was a beautiful day here. I hope you guys enjoyed the weather where you are. Okay, so for March 20th, we're going to be reading from Deuteronomy 19-20, through 20, Psalms 34, and Luke 20. So Deuteronomy 19, chapter 19, Cities of Refuge. The Lord your God will soon destroy the nations whose land he is giving you, and you will displace them and settle in their towns and homes. Then you must set apart three cities of refuge in the land the Lord your God is giving you to occupy. Divide the land the Lord your God is giving you into three districts, with one of these cities in each district. Keep the roads to these cities in good repair so that anyone who has killed someone can flee there for safety. If someone accidentally kills a neighbor without harboring any previous hatred, the slayer may flee to any of these cities and be safe. For example, suppose someone goes into the forest with a neighbor to cut wood, and suppose one of them swings an axe and the axe head flies off the handle, killing the other person. In such cases, the slayer could flee to one of the cities of refuge and be safe. If the distance to the nearest city of refuge was too far, an enraged, an enraged avenger might be able to chase down and kill the person who caused the death. The slayer would die even though there was no death sentence and the first death had been an accident. That is why I am commanding you to set aside three cities of refuge. If the Lord your God enlarges your territory as he solemnly promised your ancestors and gives you all the land he promised them, you must designate three additional cities of refuge. He will give you this land if you obey all the commands I have given you, if you always love the Lord your God and walk in his ways. That way you will prevent the death of innocent people in the land the Lord your God is giving you as a special possession, and you will not be held responsible for murder. But suppose someone hates a neighbor and deliberately ambushes and murders that neighbor, and then escapes to one of the cities of refuge. In that case, the leaders of the murderer's hometown must have the murderer brought back from the city of refuge and handed over to the dead person's avenger to be killed. Do not feel sorry for that murderer. Purge the guilt of, of murder from Israel so all may go well with you. Concern for Justice when you arrive in the land the Lord your God is giving you as a special possession, never steal someone's land by moving the boundary markers your ancestors set up to mark their property. Never convict anyone of a crime on the testimony of just one witness. The facts of the case must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If a malicious witness comes forward and accuses someone of a crime, then both the accuser and accused must appear before the priests and judges who are on duty before the Lord. They must be closely questioned. And if the accuser is found to be lying, the accuser will receive the punishment intended for the accused. In this way, you will cleanse such evil from among you. Those who hear about it will be afraid to do such an evil thing again. You must never show pity. Your rules, your rules should be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Chapter 20. Regulations Concerning War When you go out to fight your enemies and your face horses and chariots and you face horses and chariots and an army greater than your own, do not be afraid. The Lord your God who brought you safely out of Egypt is with you. Before you go into battle, the priest will come forward to speak with the troops. He will say, listen to me, all you men of Israel, do not be afraid as you go out to fight today. Do not lose heart or panic. For the Lord your God is going with you. He will fight for you against your enemies and he will give you victory. Then the officers of the army will address the troops and say, has anyone just built a new house? but not yet dedicated it? If so, go home. You might be killed in battle and someone else would dedicate your house. Has anyone just planted a vineyard but not yet eaten any of its fruit? If so, go home. You might die in battle and someone else would eat from it. Has anyone just become engaged? Well, go home and get married. You might die in battle and someone else would marry your fiance. Then the officers will also say, Is anyone terrified? If you are, go home before you frighten anyone else. When the officers have finished saying this to their troops, they will announce the names of the unit commanders. As you approach a town to attack it, first offer its people terms of peace. If they accept your terms and open the gates to you, then all the people inside will serve you in forced labor. But if they refuse to make peace and prepare to fight, you must attack the town. When the Lord your God hands it over to you, kill every man in the town. But you may keep for yourselves all the women, children, livestock, and other plunder. You may enjoy the spoils of your enemies that the Lord your God has given you. 
but these instructions apply only to distant towns, not to the towns of nations nearby. As for the towns of the nations the Lord your God has given you as a special possession, destroy every living thing in them. You must completely destroy the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, just as the Lord your God has commanded you. This will keep the people of the land from teaching you their detestable customs in the worship of their gods, which would cause you to sin deeply against the Lord your God. When you are besieging a town and the war drags on, do not destroy the trees. Eat the fruit, but do not cut down the trees. They are not enemies that need to be attacked. But you may cut down trees that you know are not valuable for food. Use them to make the equipment you need to besiege the town until it falls. And Psalms 34. A Psalm of David regarding the time he pretended to be insane in front of Abimelech who sent him away. I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are discouraged take heart. Come, let us tell the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. I prayed to the Lord and he answered me, freeing me from all my fears. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. I cried out to the Lord in my suffering and he heard me. He set me free from all my fears. For the angel of the Lord guards all who fear him and he rescues them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who trust in him. Let the Lord's people show him reverence, for those who honor him will, will have all they need. Even strong young lions sometimes go hungry, but those who trust in the Lord will never lack anything good, any good thing. Come, my children, and listen to me, and I will teach you to fear the Lord. Do any of you want to live a life that is long and good? Then watch your tongue. Keep your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Work hard at living in peace with others. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. His ears are open to their cries for help. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. He will erase their memory from the earth. The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous face many troubles, but the Lord rescues them from each and every one. For the Lord protects them from harm. Not one of their bones will be broken. Calamity will surely overtake the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be punished. But the Lord will redeem those who serve him. Everyone who trusts in him will be freely pardoned. And Luke 20. The authority of Jesus challenged. One day as Jesus was teaching and preaching the good news in the temple, the leading priests and teachers of religious law and other leaders came up to him. They demanded, By whose authority did you drive out the merchants from the temple? Who gave you such authority? Let me ask you a question first, he replied. Did John's baptism come from heaven or was it merely human? They talked it over among themselves. If we say it was from heaven, he'll ask why we didn't believe him. But if we say it was merely human, the people will stone us because they are convinced he was a prophet. Finally, they replied, we don't know. And Jesus responded, Then I won't answer your question either. Story of the evil farmers. Now Jesus turned to the people again and told them this story. A man planted a vineyard, le leased it out to tenant farmers, and moved to another country to live for several years. At great picking time, he sent one of his servants to collect his share of the crop. But the farmers attacked the servant, beat him up, and sent him back empty-handed. So the owner sent another servant. But the same the, but the same thing happened. He was beaten up and treated shamefully, and he went away empty-handed. A third man was sent, and the same thing happened. He, too, was wounded and chased away. What will I do? The owner asked himself. I know. I'll send my cherished son. Surely they will respect him. But when the farmers saw his son, they said to each other, Here comes the heir to this estate. Let's kill him and get the estate for ourselves. So they dragged him out of the vineyard and murdered him. What do you suppose the owner of the vineyard will do to these farmers? Jesus asked. I'll tell you. He will come and kill them all and lease the vineyard to others. But God forbid that such a thing should ever happen, his listeners protested. Jesus looked at them and said, Then what do the scriptures mean? The stone rejected by the builders has now become the cornerstone. All who stumble over that stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the teachers of religious law and the leading priests heard the story, they wanted to arrest Jesus immediately because they realized he was pointing at them, that they were the farmers in the story, but they were afraid there would be a riot if they arrested him. Taxes for Caesar 
Watching for their opportunity, the leaders sent secret agents pretending to be honest men. They tried to get Jesus to say something that could be reported to the Roman governor so he would be arrest Jesus. They asked, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right and not influ are not influenced by what others think. You sincerely teach the ways of God. Now tell us, is it right to pay taxes to the Roman government or not? He saw through their trickery and said, Show me a Roman coin. Whose picture and title are stamped on it? Caesar's, they replied. Well, then he said, give to Caesar what belongs to him, but everything that belongs to God must be given to God. So they failed to trap him in the presence of the people. Instead, they were amazed by his answer, and they were silenced. Discussion about resurrection. Then some Sadducees, Sadducees stepped forward, and a group of Jews who say there is no resurrection after death, they posed this question. Teacher, Moses gave us a law that if a man dies, leaving a wife but no children, his brother should marry the widow and have a child who will be the brother's heir. Well, there were seven brothers. The oldest married and then died without children. His brother married the widow, but he also died. Still no children. And so it went, one after the other, until each of the seven had married her and died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died too. So tell us, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? For all seven were married to her. Jesus replied, Marriage is for people here on earth, but that is not the way it will be in the age to come. For those worthy of being raised from the dead won't be married then, and they will never die again. In these respects, they are like angels. They are children of God raised up to new life. But now, as to whether the dead will be raised, even Moses proved this when he wrote about the burning bush. Long after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died, he referred to the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So he is the God of the living, not the dead. They are all alive to him. Well said, teacher, remarked some of the teachers of religious law who were standing there. And that ended their questions. No one dared to ask any more. Whose son is the Messiah? Then Jesus presented them with a question. Why is it, he asked, that the Messiah is said to be the son of David? For David himself wrote in the books of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. Since David called him Lord, how can he be his son at the same time? Then, with the crowds listening, he turned to his disciples and said, Beware of those teachers, these teachers of religious law, for they love to pray in flowing robes and to have everyone bow to them as they walk in the marketplaces, and how they love the seats of honor in the synagogues and at banquets. But they shamelessly cheat widows out of their property, and then to cover up the kind of people they really are, they make long prayers in public. Because of this, their punishment will be the greater. That is all for today's reading, and I will see you next time.